Good morning. <clears throat> the American College of Surgeons Education and Self-Assessment Program is 45. It's time to celebrate. And um, CSAP 16 uh, is, is out at this uh, Surgical Congress. And uh, <clears throat> it, it, as you know, it's, it, this is the premier self-assessment and uh, cognitive skills educational resource for practicing surgeons and for surgical residents. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, each year since this program was introduced, uh, the enrollment has increased, which is, uh, demonstrates its success. <clears throat> Over this past nearly half century, I remember well in the early 70s when this was first uh, introduced, uh, in Georgia, we began a um, chapter a CSAP review course, which was uh, very successful and uh, went on for about 10 years. <clears throat> so how did this evolve? Uh, for this fourth meeting of the history group, we will have uh, John Weigelt, FAC, MD FACS, the medical director of the CSAP program, to tell us how this um, has developed since the early 70s. And um, no one is more qualified to make the presentation than he. He is the John Abrahamian uh, 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 Professor of Surgery and Chief of the Division of Trauma and Critical Care at the Medical College of Wisconsin, his MD alma mater, and he also has a, a, a DVM from Michigan State. He trained in surgery at uh, a Parkland Southwestern in Dallas, and he's a highly, highly regarded uh, t teacher from Southwestern to Minnesota and for many years now at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He has served in, he, he has received multiple teaching awards he has been named a, a Parkland Giant. He's received the Wangenstein Award at the University of Minnesota and has received the American College of Surgeons most prestigious award, the Distinguished, Sur uh, Distinguished Service Award. John is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Surgical Education. So I could go on, but uh, John, Master Teacher, thank you for all your years of service to the college and particularly to CSAP, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, when Lamar asked me last year if I would be willing to do this, uh, I actually didn't even hesitate. Uh, history, whether it be the Civil War, whether it be uh, the Western Indian, uh, I guess we would call them conflicts. Uh, history has is, is truly been part of my uh, career and, sur and sur certainly surgical education has been very, very dear and uh, close to me. So this has really been uh, fun this last year putting this together uh, using some of the archive data from the college as well as uh, leaning on a lot of the people who led me down this path uh, and trying to put it together and hopefully I'll give you a, a, a good perspective of where we've been and maybe a little bit about where we're going. So. <clears throat> I actually started on CSAP 7. Uh, I did not ha keep that copy, uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, 9 and 10, uh, and this is really the 13 was really the first time we went into the electronic age, so we go from true paper in that previous slide to this electronically. So my objectives are pretty simple. But it's very interesting. When I started this, I thought this was all going to be about CSAP and how we developed it and uh, a lot of different things. But 
To really understand where we are with CSAP, you have to go back to the history of continuing medical education, which I found even more fascinating. So we're going to start there. We're going to talk about the development by the ACS, some key people and leaders, uh, some changes with time, some spin-offs, and then I'm going to give you a, what I think are the challenges for the future. So this all started in 1966. There was a National Advisory Committee on Health Manpower, okay? President Johnson made the appointees, and the purpose was to improve availability and utilization of health manpower. Now, this is a document. It's a fascinating document. It's not, uh, as we were told at the opening ceremony, it's not seven feet tall. Back then, they, they must have liked trees more than they do now, but uh, it's a pretty thick document. But hidden in it is a report that addressed medical education, and in that, there was a comment about relicensing, and that CME would be required plus a challenge examination. But there's two sentences in there that are very telling, and though that is that the CME and the examination should be based on the physician's practice pattern. It should not be broad-based, but should be focused. Uh, and I want you to remember those two comments because as we come back around to the end of this talk, you will see that we have really come full circle. So, 1968 change for CME had arrived, you might say, or at least the first change. Now at that time, many of us in the room can remember, CME was attendance-based. You uh, showed up, you signed in, hopefully you stayed, uh, and you got credit, okay? Uh, the LCCME and the AMA uh, Committee on Accreditation of CME became the ACCME in 1980. And one of the other things in continuing education, it, it's amazing how many abbreviations you have to try to remember. Uh, I'm not going to, there's no quiz at the end, uh, but we would uh, say there were seven founding organizations. The college was not one of the organizations in this uh, group but the AMA was, uh, as well as most of the medical boards or the organization for the medical boards across the United States. You've read the purpose already, but, but you can see when you look at that purpose and think about how CME has evolved, uh, that's a very highfalutin purpose when you look at all those things uh, that are listed there. Uh, and even the lights feel a little uh, <laughs> uh, challenged. So anyway, let, let's, let's trace this a little bit, okay? So actually in 1982, the ACCME then came out with their first kind of statements, and it was called the Seven Essentials. And there were mission statements, there was you needed to form a needs assessment, define some objectives, and assess the effectiveness. Sounds pretty uh, sim similar to what we see today, but in reality, mostly this was process, and measuring the effectiveness was certainly something that we really didn't know how to do. The next step was System 98, okay? And again, they looked at essential areas and their elements, and at this point was the first statement where they tried to link the CME activities to physician performance. And then in 02, the next change, they called it the competency and continuum of change. And at that point, lo and behold, we now have the ABMS competencies entering the picture. So, when you look at the competencies, CME falls under that lifelong learning and self-assessment. Five concepts were endorsed. Uh, it's got to be effective in changing practice, which when you read that statement, it sounds like a good statement, but trying to measure that is very difficult. Uh, the, the educational activities should be related to quality and safety. Remember, this is in 2002 
before real equality and safety became a mantra for all of us in the field of healthcare. Uh, it must be valid and linked to the MD practice. I bring you back to the 1968 document where it should be focused to what the physician is doing. And obviously free from commercial bias uh, and should be part of a system of physician accountability. So in 06, more changes occurred. Now we link it directly to quality and safety. They started with 22 criteria. In 14, they were a little more reasonable and reduced it to 19 criteria. And they, for, at that point, they uh, recognized four official and still recognize four official international collaborators with the ACCME. And I just point out that one of our uh, organizations that we are here with uh, at this meeting, at every meeting uh, for the college's meeting, is the Royal College Physician of Surgeons and from Canada. So at this point, AMA, somewhere in the early 2000s, became a major CME player. So in 1968, they actually generated what we now call the Physician's Recognition Award. Uh, they set the criteria, really, for CME credits. Category 1 was then sanctioned by AMA and the ACCME, and there is a sanctioning process by the AMA to allow an institution, such as the American College of Surgeons, to grant CME credits. Uh, and category one is the sanctioned uh, credits, and category two are all others, okay? So let's take a look at this category one, which impacts directly on what we now call maintenance of certification. So here are the AMA 10 core requirements that you will find in the PRA document. And Again, you can read these. They're basically the simil similar to what had been developed over the, the past almost uh, uh, 40 years. But I want to point out seven, and that's why it's in, in italics. So it's the effectiveness of achieving educational goals. And this really set the stage for where we are today, okay? And that is self-assessment. And this is where the first use of pre and post tests became part of the uh, process, if you will, of allowing somebody to claim category one uh, CME credits. So in theory, the pre and post test uh, is you assess knowledge before the event, you assess knowledge after the event, and in general, the feeling is that this is a way to measure the value of the value or effectiveness of the CME. And at this point, we really have entered the realm of self-assessment for CME. So that's where we are. That's how we got to this self-assessment. Now, let's let's take a step back and let's start with our evolution. Again, this all started about the time that that document came out uh, from the Presidential Committee. So the Committee on Continuing Education in 1968, same time that the, the report came out, said we need a CME product. If you go back and look at what they said that product should be, it should be clinically oriented, should be well constructed, it should focus on defined categories within the realm of surgery. There was Dr. Harold Sintel, who was at the Department of Special Educational Pro Projects, which was giving, he was given the task of developing this CME product, uh, along with uh, Heinz, uh, who was in the communication department at that time. So CSAP-1 became a reality in 1971. Uh, remember, we started thinking about this in 1968. It was, it was done in collaboration with the National Board of Medical Examiners. Uh, for CSAP-1, there were 44 listed authors. There were 17 uh, categories. Questions were submitted. There was not much of a formal meeting about or discussion of those questions. They were submitted. The committee that was put together 
uh, selected 760, and actually 15,000 surgeons subscribed. Subscribed. We don't know what they did with it, but they subscribed. Okay? And it was considered a success, and they moved forward with this process. So CSAP 2 was produced in 1975, four years later, if you think about it, and CSAP 3, another four years, 1979. Uh, CSAP 2, uh, the ACS held the copyright. Uh, neurosurgery uh, was deleted. There's a lot of reasons why they were deleted uh, from CSAP 2, but they decided to go their own way. Uh, and a decision was made after CSAP 3 that maybe a three-year cycle would be the right duration of uh, between issues. And there was also a decision made that on, for CSAP 3, they had to identify a medical editor or medical coordinator, as it was called at that time. Now, in my investigation of this whole process, I uh, spent some time with friends in the American College of Physicians because MixAP preceded CSAP, uh, you can see 1967. They were a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, and actually, the initial group from putting CSAP together met with the leaders who put MixAP together from uh, ACP, and they really helped fashion uh, CSAP as it is today. Uh, and if you look at MixAP, MixAP and CSAP have very strong roots that go, that are entangled together. Don Dye is uh, one of my contacts, contacts at ACP, and and he and the executive director were very helpful in understanding the interaction between CSAP and MixAP. Uh, it was very interesting back in the early then 70s, the recognition that the knowledge and gap identification was extremely hard. And if you remember, if any of you go through CME, you know you, you have to do a gap analysis right now. And, after struggling through many of those, it's still difficult. Uh, and so we spent a long time in our learning process, and we're still learning, I would say. So CCE then from the ACS identified this need for medical direction. That coordinator was uh, established for CSAP 3. And then there was a change in 04 where the C CCE gave up the oversight of CSAP to the CSAP Advisory Committee under the Division of Education under Dr. Sach Deva. Uh, the medical director role was established and self-assessment at this time was well established, but still changes were needed. So here are your coordinators or directors, uh, starting with one. Uh, and at one and two were essentially the chairs of the CCE at the time. Jack Pickleman came on board on CSAP 3 through 6. Joyce came on from 6 through 10. Ward Griffin did one. And then I have been the medical director uh, since CSAP 12. Here's three of my uh, predecessors. Uh, Jack and Joyce have contributed a lot to what I've learned over the last year putting this together. And uh, Ward certainly was, uh, was instrumental when I was uh, a member of the CSAP Advisory Committee under his tutelage. The other thing I'll just mention very briefly is the support staff over the year. Marilyn Lux was there from 3 through 14 as our medical editor and coordinator. Our Belinda is, uh, go has joined us in, six, in 13. She is retiring in about two weeks. Uh, and Krissa was brought on as a medical editor for CSAP 15 uh, and has continued through CSAP 16. So let me just go through the format of how we get this done. So actually, Jack was very instrumental in establishing the format as it currently exists. Uh, we usually use a type A question, which is five answer, multiple choice. 
Uh, sometimes we use a matching stem and a true-false stem. Uh, in the initial uh, introduction, it was an open book, self-assessment. Uh, once again, you basically submitted your answer sheet, you received credit, there was no scoring, no self-assessment aspect, except the fact that you were given the book with the answers and you were uh, on your good behavior to not use an open book approach. There was no pre and post test uh, and actually Jack introduced something that he thought was very good and that was patient management problems which I'll also discuss. So in other words, the stem with five possible answers, you can, uh, patients with advanced pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema have an increased X, I uh, picked the right answer. Uh, we won't make you fill out the forms that I were originally going to give everybody to take the test today. Uh, but anyway, you then had a type B question, which was you had to match these uh, to, the, to one, one side to the other. And then a type C was really a true-false question uh, where you had to say they were associated or not. Uh, what about these patient management problems? This was an a, uh, idea of Jack's and the committee at the time to examine a surgeon's decision making. Uh, and this is a management decision based on a scenario. You had this magic eraser that you erased things as you went down through the, uh, through the, the uh, question and you were told whether that was uh, good or bad uh, and uh, you came out at the end uh, with a live patient or a dead patient depending upon which ones you erased. Uh, the committee consensus to get these patient management uh, problems done was extremely difficult. On 7 and 8 when I joined CSAP I was on the PMP uh, committee uh, and I can tell you that the discussion was robust about which tests should be obtained for which at what time in a patient's uh, course. Uh, and it really was a very uh, difficult uh, question to put together. Scoring was also difficult. Did you subtract points? Did you give points? It lasted through eight uh, and then it faded into history. I think it was a very good idea. It may actually, uh, some people have suggested with the computer, that com computer strength we have now, it may actually be a way to go back to trying to uh, examine decision making of, of within a surgical problem. We've changed a lot with author instructions. The instruction book used to be a couple of pages. Uh, it now has grown over time. We spend a lot of time, especially with new authors, uh, about question construction. Uh, and what looks like a good question may not be as good as you think it is. Uh, and so we, we have done a fair amount with, if you will, education of even putting the questions together. We do require a minimum of two references. And most of the time, since we explain all of the answers, right answer and wrong answer, it usually takes really a minimum of four references before you're, you're finished with trying to uh, provide the reference that will give you the right answers and the wrong answers. We have never allowed all of the above answers. Uh, there have been, in CSAP 15, there was one none of the above. Uh, CSAP 16, we have none of those this time. And there's always been a concern from our users that we should avoid esoteric questions. Uh, and how to define that sometimes is difficult, uh, but uh, that, is all, that has been one uh, complaint, uh, that we have too many esoteric questions in CSAP and they're not pertinent to the practicing surgeon. We also have identified that there are many topics on an, the, on an, on an individual basis that are just too new to be placed in CSAP. Uh, I will tell you that there are always new topics that come up uh, during the CSAP writing process. And the idea is that we're trying to provide some general knowledge and a, a general approach to the, the field of surgery. 
and hitting on just what got published in one or two articles is not really where we have taken CSAP. So how do we put this all together? Seven committees of six ACS fellows write their set of questions. Everybody writes about 25 questions each. We start the cycle usually in March, so this coming March we'll start CSAP 17 cycle. We assign the topics for each author, uh, and as I said, each author gets 25. They submit their questions. We now do it electronically, uh, and then we meet about four months later to review and edit face-to-face -face with each of the authors. Uh, a reviewer, one of the colleagues on the committee is the reviewer for the, each of uh, the other members of the committee. And again, it's a very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, hearty discussion of, on these questions. And once they are uh, reviewed by the committee, they are approved and then passed to the next step. And then critiques are written for each question. Again, it's a, the critiques are submitted. They are submitted electronically and, and, and shared electronically. And then we meet four to six months for final review. The final review, the final material that is approved, uh, and, and we do uh, trash questions. Uh, we find that uh, what we thought was a good question the first time uh, didn't turn out to be as good. And sometimes the author finds that trying to write the critique in a, in a fashion that is uh, acceptable to them is not possible and they trash their own questions. Once a final set is done, they are checked one more time by the author for content and then we do our final editing uh, between myself and our medical editor. We obtain permissions, production begins, and we introduce it every three years at the Clinical Congress. And, was, and Lamar mentioned that 2016 is the 45th year for CSAP. So it may be happy birthday. I couldn't decide if it was happy birthday or if it was happy anniversary. So you, you can pick, pick and choose. We'll, we'll talk about both. Some other changes and something that is in our history. We, we did try a two-year format in 1993. I was part of that as the steering committee, and it was really too intense, trying to get everybody together, trying to get those written. We, we did not think our product was as good as we thought it was, uh, as it should be, and so we went back to a three-year format. We started an electronic format for the first time in CSAP 12, and the total questions have now increased from 650 to 850, and for that, we added an extra committee uh, for CSAP 16. Uh, the first author meeting used to be, there's some of you in the room that remember, we all used to fly in to Chicago. We used to spend about a day. Uh, the new authors were indoctrinated, you might say. Uh, and then we kind of split up into our committees, made the assignments, uh, set our first meeting, and then all flew home. Uh, we now have that first author meeting as a teleconference and our meeting locations usually were uh, for each of those committee meetings were usually at O'Hare Airport, the Hilton there, but now we have moved down to ACS headquarters uh, which has made it much more easier on college staff. We made one final change for CSAP 16. We always have negative questions in CSAP 16, we've always used the excuse that the accept question was easier to write. Uh, we get a lot of comments about that it, they're harder to answer. Uh, I would tell you uh, they're all, they are harder to write, uh, but we got rid of them in CSAP 16. CSAP 15, we organized them together so your mind didn't have to go through a positive and negative which our educators say is uh, one of the reasons they're harder to answer. CSAP 14 was a major step in redesign because we needed to meet some CME changes and this was the pre-test, post-test format. Uh, so there is now a self-assessment format. You go through uh, the test questions first uh, and you essentially then 
can take the test mode if you think you, so the self-assessment, you answer the question, you look at the critique, and then when you're ready, you can do your post-test, which is you can only look at the answers and you have to have an 80% correct uh, response rate in that testing uh, format. Uh, we have, what we do, if you do not meet that, what we've designed into it is that you, can, you need to go back through uh, the syllabus again and you need to then uh, say I'm ready to take the test again and your retest is uh, only on the missed items, your score is collated uh, as a summary score. Uh, we do flip the answers when you go back the second time. So it doesn't help to write what was the right answer down. So, And we do give category one CME credits. Uh, used to be 60 and now it's a complete 90 for the entire product. So that gets us to MOC and the category one self-assessment uh, and the class two in the MOC. So. We are listed, CSAP is listed as a, uh, by the ABS as compliant with MOC. Uh, we definitely saw a change in enrollment. Lamar mentioned the increasing enrollment. Uh, and we also made a change so that you can have a modular format for the credits so that you didn't have to wait to get all 90 credits until you finish the entire program. So this is our sales. Uh, this is from CSAP 10 to CSAP 15. This is uh, obviously uh, the first time we really have great data uh, on the, uh, the uh, sales. And what you see there is the sales between the total sales is in blue. The fellows are, the ACS fellows are in orange and the yellow are resident subscriptions. If you look at the format, the format is changing as well. Uh, in this slide, the green, that light green, this first one is the CME web only, okay? And then if you look at this one, this is CME with print. So what happens now is that you can get the print once you finish the entire program. But if we sent the print with initially, uh, you would have a way to uh, have uh, an open book test again. And so the, the print is actually held back until you are finished with the entire program. Now, the CME has become the more popular, if you will. Uh, aspect of the course now. You can see C, uh, for 15 uh, between the CME uh, with print and CME alone, uh, we're, we're, all, we're basically the majority of our sales are, are in that area. We have done away for CSAP 16 with the CD format, so now it's either you can have print only, which means that that's no uh, that is no uh, CME, or you can have the CME web and uh, then you get the print at the end. Some of our surgeon comments share with you, we get lots of them. Uh, I answer all content questions for the entire cycle. It's now done electronically and I can tell you that I have lots of uh, interactions on the internet with lots of people who want to uh, quiz me uh, or quiz us uh, based upon our uh, questions. We do have this complaint of lack of internal consistency in the critiques between questions. That's because medicine is still not consistent across everybody's idea going back to writing the patient management problems. We try very hard to not use the, the uh, dispute, if you will, in our uh, STEM or in our answers, but we try to provide the, off, the reader or the user with uh, the broad spectrum of information that is part of the controversy in any given topic. We also get this, this comment, especially about this time in the cycle, that our question is not consistent with new data. And what, we, what I usually find is that those are papers that have been written since 
CSAP was put to bed, and that, that leads you to potential future developments of how to maintain CSAP as a very current uh, assessment of surgical knowledge. However, most comments are complimentary, uh, and actually most of the comments that I get back after I answer are still complimentary. And uh, after my explanation, most people can see the other side. And uh, like I said, I, I've had lots of good contacts with surgeons across actually the world uh, using CSAP. We do make mistakes despite our editing process. We're getting better. Uh, we have some electronic help now, but uh, and in the electronic format, we can make those changes. Unfortunately, as long as we continue to print books, we, once the book is printed, it's pretty hard to make a change. The negative co questions I've said are hard for us, and those are the places that we make the most mistakes. Or we sometimes, as I mentioned, we explain wrong and right answers, but sometimes we miss explaining the wrong answer because we're so excited to explain the right answer. Surgeon evaluations, we have, uh, we have one area that uh, we would like to improve, and that is how clear are the questions. Uh, we only have about a, uh, if you will, we're down in the 40% range where all the others are up in the 70% range. And once again, writing questions despite our best efforts, trying to make them as clear as possible is, is, is a huge task for each committee and a huge task for new authors that come on. Uh, some of them think they write very good questions and during the critique fo uh, format that we have, they learn that maybe they're not, uh, not following the directions as closely as they should. So how about some spin-offs that CSAP has generated? Well, those many in, in the room will also remember that uh, we always had an introduction course uh, at the Congress whenever CSAP was introduced. That started in 81. It stopped in 11, mainly because of, of uh, declining attendance. Uh, but it was uh, very popular in its days, but I think as we became more electronically uh, focused, it uh, began to lose some of its uh, appeal. Audio Companion came on in CSAP 11, uh, which is an audio tape series that I'll go through. Uh, and then CSAP Sampler came on in CSAP 12. So Audio Companion, uh, is a audio format. Uh, it was approved uh, by the CSAP committee uh, and its first rendition was Dr. Pat O'Leary sitting here in the front. Uh, and he basically went through many of the, cat all of the categories of CSAP and discussed the questions with a number, with a number of us uh, as we uh, generated this audio uh, companion. I took over in 12 and have been doing it now through 15. Uh, I have just uh, completed it for 16. Uh, it is not out yet, not, not uh, available yet. Uh, and I changed the format a little bit uh, because I was worried that we were encroaching somewhat on CSAP. So uh, at this point what I do is I take the authors and I discuss their areas of expertise uh, and really ask them pretty much a little, um, little bit of new data. Sometimes there's a new article that looks like it's a hot topic and I'll bring that up. But we did this without a lot, I mean with a lot of consideration and I must say I was against it in the beginning uh, but I have learned a lot about audio learners. Uh, it is a different learning style. Uh, and there are all different types of learners, but the audio learner seems to be uh, an a entity that we're going to need to uh, uh, cater to. And actually, if you've noticed uh, already the uh, selected readings, which is, was at Parkland for many years, but has been taken over by the college and Lou Flint, there's now going to be an audio component to that. Uh, we do this modules uh, by, by the categories. I weight it very similar to uh, what CSAP is weighted, so I spend more time on GI and abdomen than I do on thoracic. 
Uh, it's an interview format, and a lot of people, including my authors, when I'm the one asking the question, say it's closer to an oral examination than it is to a written examination. Uh, so interviews, they, they generate some flashcards for the users. There, it is a self-assessment. Again, it's category one, and it's worth 30 uh, category one credits from the ACS. It's what it looks like. Uh, there now is an MP3 format as well and a web-based format, so they're, they're also uh, moving with the times. The sampler came on in 12. Uh, this was a way to use the uh, extra questions. Uh, if you do the calculation, we, we have somewhere around 400 to 500 extra questions. Many of them are duplicates or are on the same topic. Uh, and we always struggled with what to do with those questions. So we developed the CSAP sampler, which is a electronic format, a web-based format. You can uh, sign up, uh, get an annual subscription. They are sent on a monthly basis. And there's a maximum of six category one credits that you can, learn, that you can earn over the year with that. Uh, this may be the, a first step into uh, an ongoing or subsequent continuation of uh, a more rapid turnaround uh, with questions uh, sent, sent to surgeons who are interested in a CME product on an ongoing basis. So my future developments, <clears throat> finishing up here, uh, we still produce, quote, the book. Uh, I think my my expectation is that will become an e-book in the near future. Uh, I'm not sure for 17, but it, it is possible. Uh, and I think uh, the book is uh, helpful and everybody likes to have it, but I think an e-book might serve the same purpose. So we're looking into that. The CSAP app was introduced uh, this cycle. So we now have an app that you can actually take uh, with you uh, and access your CSAP through the web. You can also, another change that occurred in CSAP 16 was a, a complaint by our users that I had to do an entire category section uh, at one time. So I had to sit down, each, each category section is about 30 to 40 questions and people were telling us, you know, why can't I just do three questions and then I have to go do a case and I can come back and I can start on the fourth question. Uh, this time you can do that. So we have listened to the, to the users and once again made a change uh, that uh, we hope will be useful to the practicing surgeon. Uh, I've made some category changes and will probably continue to do that. While re recertification is one use of CSAP, we don't always mimic all of the ABS recertification categories. We again listen. Uh, there was a hue and cry for more patient safety and quality uh, topics to be addressed in, uh, in the critiques of CSAP 15. So in CSAP 16, I changed that to include quality and safety a little, a little more. Uh, we now have this modular format where you can complete each category, get your CME credits, and then at the end you can uh, submit and once you've done everything you'll get another certificate for the entire 90. But this way you can actually select and do 30 a year, which if you look at the MOC, that's what you need on an annual basis for those three years in between uh, for M MOC. So this is what 16 looks like. It's now on all sorts of formats. So it's still got the book, it's still got a note, but it's got an electronic notebook and it's got the little app. Uh, so in summary, bringing this all together, uh, this started with continuing medical education and it continues to be the driving force for an, the future development, what happens in CME, CSAP is going to have to pay attention to and adapt. Key people and leaders, I think without the key people that I have mentioned, as well as all of the authors, uh, this could never be put together. It's not me, it's uh, really the people that work hard to put their best foot forward when they're trying to make this CME product. 
We have changed with the time. The MOC is another challenge. How do you select the right balance and value that's added for the surgeon? Will MOC stay the way it is? There's a lot of talk about the high stakes exam, whether that's going to exist. Some of the professional uh, board, some of the boards are trying to do away with that. I, I know the ABS is talking about it. Uh, how CSAP would fit into that, I think we need to always be cognizant that it's a great product and potentially has very good value in that way. I've told you about the spin-offs, the email and the audio, and as I mentioned, the e-book I think is coming. Uh, the future developments, this more e-learning, being more nimble, being quick on our feet, being more maybe updated. You know, I said we, we tried two years, it didn't work, but maybe an ongoing update is what is needed. And constantly we need to figure out better ways to serve the educational needs of the members of our surgical communities. Uh, so in closing, I would say I owe a sincere thanks to a lot of people. Some of them are mentioned here, the ACS staff and the Division of Education. I can't tell you how great it's been to work with all the authors I have had the pleasure to, to meet and work with. Uh, my CSAP committee is wonderful. Uh, but really, my mentors, when I go back in my career and think of some of my mentors uh, at UT Southwestern, at the University of uh, Minnesota, and now at Milwaukee, I can't thank them enough for instilling, me, instilling in me some of the things that, that still drive me on a daily basis. And most of all, I, I thank my family who let me do a lot of things uh, that uh, maybe I, I should have been home for, but they, they were understanding and allowed me to do uh, things that help a lot of people uh, across the world. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Very nice. It's a very nice summary of uh, the history of CSAP. Dr. Maddox? Yes, I have a history of surgery trivia question. In the 1970s, Henry Cleveland and uh, Charlie Wolfer waived honoraria uh, for the speakers of the Las Vegas and Atlantic City trauma meetings in order to initiate a new program. That new program was called Surgery Residence Trauma Paper Competition. The very first resident winner of that program was Dr. John Weigel. The quest first, congratulations. The question is, <laughs> what year a little, was little. that and what was the topic? Well, the topic was ARDS. Was the, say again? The place, the place was the Broadmoor uh, and must have been, uh, I was a fourth year resident, so it had to be 1972. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> AR, adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Hard, okay. Hard. It was just, it was just the beginning. <laughs> Long memories. Other questions? I, I, had a, I had a brief question for you, John. Sure. Um, how closely does the questions on CSAP correlate with the board examination questions? Uh, we're not supposed to do that. Uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, one of the reasons that some of my authors uh, recuse themselves from, being, from continuing on the CSAP is because they now are appointed to the board and will be writing board questions. So we are we are sensitive to that issue. We, we try to keep them separate. I don't, I, I used to write board questions for critical care. I don't write board questions at all anymore. Marshall. John, do you use new questions for every cycle or do you use some of the old questions? Yeah. Right. No, we we. That's one of the reasons we developed CSAP Sampler because we we do not uh, repeat. We do not use any of the old questions. Once the questions are put to bed at the end of a cycle, they are truly put to bed, except to be used for CSAP Sampler. Uh, what I have started to do for the last two cycles is to look at the topics 
that have been covered by questions in uh, the previous CSAP and what hasn't been covered. And so what I have started to do is to give the authors a list of topics that I thought were sparsely covered in the previous CSAP. So, and we, we're probably gonna, gonna do that a little more formally as we go forward to try to keep as fresh a look on CSAP as possible. Lamar, you had a question? There's a great pre presentation, John. And to me, it reflects on the history of, of our college so well. We've always been committed to education, quality, and, um, and on surgeons. Um, when Franklin Martin first started with the Clinical Congress, he expected two or three hundred to attend. 1,500 came. 15,000 signed up for CSAP, and now this continues to grow. We've moved from uh, dogma to data. What do you think the impact of big data will have on all of our educational and uh, sci scientific endeavors? I impact of what, Lamar? Big, big data. Big? The, the way, uh, you know, we're, we're collecting now, particularly in cancer and in trauma as well, enormous quantities of data, and the answers are not particularly uh, the same that, that have been reflected in the literature from smaller series. Uh, well, certainly what, when I, I, I guess the best way to answer that, Lamar, is how I answer everybody's uh, content question. So a surgeon sends me a critique of uh, sometimes it's one question, sometimes it's, uh, I think the most I've gotten is 120 questions that, have, that somebody says, I've got a little problem with this. And I start that, I start that response with the same, re same response each time. Uh, number one, I say I, I review all content questions. And then my, my next sentence is that CSAP is written by ACS fellows who try their best to blend evidence and experience into a learning event for general surgeons. And I think the discussions that we have at each committee for each question and each critique are just that. It is a discussion between the, what is the current evidence, if there's good evidence, and what is the experience of those six surgeons sitting around the table to try to give an answer and a critique that is worthwhile. And I, I think that's what it's always going to be because we're never going to have, even with these big databases, we're not going to have all of the evidence, all of the time to say this is category one evidence and, and it's, it's uh, irrefutable. 